I'm Bobby Halton and welcome to Trusted Voices. Thank you for joining us today and today it's our distinct pleasure to have with us Chief Ronnie Coleman. For those of you who know the Chief from his many roles in the American Fire Service over the past 48 years, Chief? Uh, 56 actually. 50, didn't mean to short change him. 56, <laughs> his short 56 year career. He has been with the California Fire Service predominantly, although he has played a major national role from time to time. Today at Trusted Voices, we're going to start off, as we usually do, with a little bit of history and bio on the Chief. And many of you may not know, although he does look like um, the California kid, a, a bit like uh, who was the kid with the pizza delivery during the fast times at Ridgemont High. He, uh, he's actually not a native Californian. You were born in Oklahoma. Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa, to be specific. Yeah, yeah, outstanding, outstanding. Now, in your early years, were you educated in Tulsa, Chief? Or I'm not sure I would call what happened to me as being an education, uh, as much as it was an experience. I went to uh, 17 different schools in 10 years, because my dad was a bus driver and kept getting transferred all the time. So I never stayed in the same school district uh, for an entire year. I would move on and move on and finally. And uh, unfortunately, and I'm first, the first to admit this, is I was a high school dropout. Wow. Now, have you ever, have you ever gone back and... I have a master's degree now. So, so a thir 30 year difference. Yeah, so you're a former high school dropout. I was a former high school dropout. Now what inspired you to rectify that situation? Well, uh, actually it was a, a Marine Corps officer, uh -huh. a gentleman named Major Hunt, who uh, walked up to me one day on maneuvers and I was sitting there reading a trashy novel of some kind and he proceeded to ask me why I was reading it. And I said, well, to keep myself entertained. He said, what do you think you're going to learn by reading that junk book? I said, I'm not sure I'm going to learn anything, but I'm going to be entertained. He says, well, I want to give you something. And he gave me a book called Rudyard Kipling's uh, uh, Stories of India. And he said, I want you to read this book, and then I'm going to ask you questions. So I read the book, and he started asking me questions. And he kind of said, I've come to one conclusion. He said, uh, uh, you're uh, very intelligent, but you're ignorant. I go, what's the difference? I mean, I thought if you're, if you're intelligent, you can't be ignorant and vice versa. He said, no, he says, you have a, a, a pretty quick mind, but the problem is you don't know anything yet. He said, I'm going to suggest you go back to school. I said, well, I'm in the Marine Corps. I can't go back to school. He said, yeah, we have a GED program. So I got signed up in a GED program and got my high school diploma while I was in the Marine Corps. Outstanding. But, so fast forward to 2016, 2017, and we've got young men and women serving in the military today. Would you encourage them to partake in fire science training and education online, which is readily available through a wide variety of sources? Absolutely, no question uh, about supporting a position like that because education is, in my personal opinion, is a lifelong experience. It's not just a one-time event. And it has more to do with discipline than it does with almost anything else. And any young person, uh, boy or girl that's in the uh, military that wants to get into the fire service has ample opportunity to prepare for it. Great. And so this is Trusted Voices, so I would love to get your position on that. There's a lot of debate. You know, in, in, the classroom is better, interpersonal is better, it's stronger, online isn't as good. but to a young man or woman who's on a ship or in Afghanistan or uh, Iraq, they don't have that opportunity for face-to-face, -face, so... Well, you know, all these alternative educational delivery systems, such as online and face-to-face, etc., uh, you're right, they're argumentative. But the reality is every one of them does one thing, and that is informed you of something you didn't know before. Uh, uh, the mechanisms themselves are not bad. They are just poorly utilized in some cases and uh, poorly administered in some cases. Uh, I would submit that an individual who's paying an awful lot of attention and really focuses on a good uh, online program is going to get as much as they would out of uh, a class that was in a contemporary classroom. Maybe short a few war stories, but the fact is that the basic concepts are teachable through that media. Outstanding. So let's go back in time. So you're a young Marine, you, you hit discharge time, and where do we go from there? Well, when I got out of the Marine Corps, my uncle was living in Southern California and I was stationed at Camp Pendleton. So I decided uh, to go visit with him and spend a couple of days with him. And I went up there and uh, 
it, this kind of leads to how I ended up getting in the Forest Service, to be honest with you, or my, my entry to the fire service career. I was living with my uncle uh, just to have some place to hang out in my hat, so to speak. And one day I rode my bicycle over to Santa Ana uh, to register for the draft. And the office across from the draft was said U.S. Forest Service on it. So I was a kind of a biology freak in those days and really interested in doing bi uh, biological studies and, and so forth. And I went in and I asked this lady named Gloria uh, if they had any job openings. She says, well, no, not today, but uh, we'll go ahead and take your name and if we get any job openings, we'll let you know. So when I went home that afternoon, got to my uncle's house, he says, some guy, gal named Gloria just called here and wants to talk to you. I said, oh, okay, what for? She said, well, I don't know, so I returned the call to her. And she says, right after you left, she said, we had a guy quit on the Tribuco district. He said, would you be interested in becoming uh, uh, an employee for the U.S. Forest Service? So I went over there and I went through the ritual and I got all signed up and everything. And a guy named Jim Sleeper picked me up. And Jim was a kind of a taciturn, very subtle individual who didn't carry on much conversation. So uh, my drive up to the, the station was pretty uh, silent, so to speak. When I got to the, uh, to the building, I, w I walked in the front door and there was a kid sitting there at the desk. He said, oh, you're the new fireman. I said, no, I said, I'm a forestry trainee. He said, you didn't read your contract, did you? I said, no, I didn't. As a matter of fact, he said, well, a forest trainee is a fireman in the Forest Service. So that's how I became a firefighter to begin with. Outstanding. Uh, what was it like back in those days? This is prior to Manning and Instant Command and all that good stuff. This is, what, what year are we in? I started my Forest Service career in 1960, wow. and uh, I worked three fire seasons in a row on the Tribuco District before I became a municipal fireman in Costa Mesa. But uh, <laughs> the best way I could describe the way things were in those days was really basic. We, we had uh, uh, a limited amount of options available to us. Our apparatus was pretty uh, plain Jane. Uh, for lack of a better term, and most of our skill sets were uh, pretty limited to things that had been developed in the Forest Service during the 1940s and early 1950s. So you, you go into the career side after about three years and you, you find yourself moving up through the ranks pretty quickly or what, what, what was the what was the One the thing I came out of the Marine Corps you? with was a strong sense of competition. And when I went into Costa Mesa, Costa Mesa was going through a lot of growth at that particular point in time. So I went from a firefighter to an engineer to a fire inspector to a captain in four years. Wow. And uh, ended up being uh, eligible for battalion chief by when I'd only hit, been on the job, I think, six years at the time. And uh, I competed for the, the exam and got it. So I ended up uh, being a, 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 let's put it this way, kind of a wet behind the ears battalion chief. <laughs> on, and on the job, on the job battalion chief. OJ, OJT was the name of the game. Right, right. There was, weren't a whole lot of preliminary classes or calls and certs as there are today, especially in the California system. The fire science program had just gotten started when I got uh, to the rank of about battalion chief and it was in the 1960s. Uh, there were uh, courses that were available. I wouldn't call what they were then what we have today as the fire science program because they were pretty basic. But in many cases, they were like in-service training programs that had been retooled for the community college. Um, and I started taking those classes and that led me to my, my A uh, degree. Wow. In, in fire science? In fire science. Wow, back in the 60s. That's in 1960s. That had to be in the, in the early days. And this is the this is the kind of the genesis of the times when we started to see paramedicine and some of those other incident command is starting to spawn about the, in California anyway, in the late 60s. Uh, it, was, it was probably 10 years later before it uh, left California. Um, but well, yeah. the actual fire scope program was, was really popularized in the early 70s okay. uh, as a result of a really bad fire season. And there were multiple departments in California that joined together to create the fire scope concept. And that, that created a committee at the statewide level. 
and started creating uh, incident training programs for ICs and, and so forth. Uh, I would characterize that as starting up about 72 or 73. Where, where was your first chief's job? Where did you land your first chief's job? My first chief's job was the city of San Clemente. Uh, I was a battalion wow. chief and an operations chief in Costa Mesa. Uh, but my first chief's job, chief of department, was San Clemente in uh, 1973. Wow, what a nice town. Yes, it was small at the time. Got bigger. Okay, yeah, it's bigger now. Yeah, it's a big town. So, now you were fire chief in several cities. Yes, I was. So from San Clemente, where did you go from there? I went from San Clemente to the city of Fullerton. Okay. And then uh, I was in Fullerton for about nine years, and I went to the state fire marshal's office, and I spent uh, about eight and a half years in the fire marshal's office, and then I became an interim chief in several other cities, such as Fremont and uh, Santa Rosa. Now, when you were in the fire marshal's office at that time, were you the state fire marshal or were you a, a, a member of the fire marshal's staff? I was the state fire marshal. So you went from chief of department to the state fire marshal for eight years? Yes. Under which governor was that? Governor Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson. Okay. 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 What, was, what was the fire marshal's office? The fire marshal's office is integral in public safety and policy making and procedures and, and, and give us a sense of where California was at that time and, and, and how, you, how, how you look at your tenure and what you think, you know, because you, obviously you've done tremendous work in terms of building construction, you've done tremendous work in terms of incident command, you've done tremendous work in terms of built-in fire protection as well as active, active and passive. So where do you feel in, in your tenure at that time this may sound like a kind of a double-edged answer because the reality is I went into the fire marshal's office when it was in kind of a weak point. Oh. Uh, it had been uh, impacted by some legislative decisions to remove certain functions from the state fire marshal's office and give it over to the hospital uh, people, the hospital planning people, and that resulted in a reduction uh, of the number of deputies that we had in the field and so forth. And I went there uh, basically after a kind of a long, excruciating uh, recruiting process, not to re necessarily rebuild the state fire marshal's office, but to redesign it. And uh, part of that redesign was to take it into uh, the uh, organizational structure of the California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection, and make it a true statewide agency. And it's, it's interesting, in California, <coughs> excuse me, the state fire marshal's office has much more to do with operations and actual firefighting than in most states. Would that be a fair thing to say? Uh, I'm going to have to put a little restriction on that. We had a lot to do with fire prevention. Obviously, okay. we had a lot to do with pipeline. We had a lot to do with arson, investi arson and bomb investigation and so forth. But uh, the fire marshal himself, or herself as the case may be, uh, did not really have a direct operational responsibility for response. That was under Office of Emergency Services. Okay, it was a Emergency Services then. Okay. But because it's such a huge state, was training... Uh, and training was under... Uh, like, I used to joke about the fact that I was fire marshal under false pretenses because I really wasn't a fire prevention guy, I was a training guy. But uh, the fact is uh, that uh, training in California is operated in the certification system is done in cooperation between the fire marshal's office as the certifying en entity and the California Community Colleges, which for the most part provides the service delivery. Now, California has a much more robust, if you will, quals and certs program compared with most states. Um, pros and cons to that? Upsides, downsides? Well, uh, it's been a little while since I've been involved in ICS because I've been retired now for over 10 years. And it's difficult for me to say exactly where things are today. But uh, the certs and quals, uh, if I could refer to as the origin of it, was the whole fire scope concept in the first place. And the adoption of the ICS and the creation of, of the uh, qualification system for that. Uh, the idea behind coming out with a certification program that was more universal occurred after the 1970 uh, uh, firestorm. It was the, the idea that they needed to get a, a better handle on the red cards or the credentials of people who uh, were being uh, asked to serve in different capacities. I, I think when we look at the California system, what I've always admired is the experiential part of the quals and certs. Rather than just relying on someone taking a course or going through some training program, those quals and certs are validated 
with some experience. So you go out and, and actually mentor. It's really the journeyman model, if you think about it, um, you know, which is really, I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a benchmark that we should really strive for. I, I don't. I wish we could do it in more places, and I wish we could do it more. Um, I don't know, more robustly in the on the structural side. It's got two sides to it. One is that kind of rigor imposes a, a certain amount of slowness with the system to be able to respond and it uh, uh, is based a little bit on the strengths and weaknesses of how you get that experience and when you get that e experience and uh, I would submit that uh, our system probably evolved the way it did because we stuck to our guns for the same process for over a 30 year period. It, it got started in the 70s and we got reinforced and got reinforced and uh, every time we had another big fire bust it, we would come out with some new ground rules for, for uh, the ICS and uh, that resulted in the system evolving over time. The, the double-edged part of it is that it's incredibly rigorous but it also assures a high level of competency. Fantastic. So we go from the fire marshal's office back to being a fire chief for a while. So one of the major accomplishments that I wanted to share with the folks that are watching today and that I think people should know about you is the Center for Public Safety Excellence. The accreditation model. The accreditation model. Where did that concept come from and how do you feel about the incredible gravitas that it has today and the incredible uh, improvement and, and, and support and inspiration that I, I think it's bringing to the fire service. Well, I'd love to say it was my idea, but it wasn't. Uh, as a matter of fact, it started out as a result of a meeting that was held with the International City Management Association uh, with a couple of fire chiefs, Warren Isman being one, and Tom Hawkins from the foundation being another, and I think Gary Rees was, uh, was at the meeting, if I remember correctly. Uh, and there was this conversation that went on about uh, how do we improve the fire service, and it was kind of a, a generalized type of thing. And, and of course, I, I can speak uh, uh, to one topic and without fear of contradiction, because Warren is was no longer with us, so I got to be careful when I say what he said. But, but essentially, Warren was very skeptical of working with the City Management Association because of his experiences. And uh, the uh, I'm trying to remember now the name of the uh, individual from the uh, ICMA, but he was the uh, uh, his name was Bill. I can't remember his last name right now. I'm sorry about that. That's okay. But uh, anyway, he finally said, well, why don't you guys have an accreditation model like law enforcement? Mm -hmm. Well, that was inflammatory. Yeah, right. <laughs> Especially you take a couple of guys and say, why don't you mirror like the, the cops? Be like the cops. Yeah, right. Good it, luck. It, it wasn't exactly fun. So uh, the information was brought back. I was a newly elected second vice president of the IFC. And the message was brought back. And if I remember correctly, at the time, the president was actually uh, a, a chief from Europe uh, named uh, Vassenar. And uh, uh, Vassenar contacted me as second VP and said, would you like to get involved in this project? And I go, I go well, what is it? He said, well, it has to do with looking at this accreditation model for uh, fire protection services. So I said, uh, and I'm not sure I would have said the same thing again today, <laughs> but I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that. And a little did I know it was going to be a 30-year commitment. But um, as a direct result of that, and I'm compressing an awful lot of information here, but we formed a task force. The task force started working on the, uh, on the project. Uh, we got funding from the IEFC to the tune of $50,000, and at $50,000 we, we doled out almost penny by a t penny at a time. It, it, we were so cheap in doing it. It took us almost uh, 20 years to convert the concept into an actual uh, deliverable document. Uh, we held meetings all over the country. We did studies of the Department of Defense. Uh, fire alarm times and you know, you, mean, you name it, uh, we, we just struggled a lot with it until we finally got a plan and once we got the plan together and we got the document together we went back to the ICMA and formed a partnership with them to form the commission on uh, accreditation. It was called, at that time it was just accrediting fire departments, it was not involved in certifying chief officers. Uh, we, we set the program up 
I became an independent 501c3 uh, organization, and as the old saying goes, the rest is history. It's continued to grow. It's uh, still evolving. Uh, I, I think I can say candidly that, that it has is, is changed today from what it was 20 years ago. But it's still focused on one thing, and that is that a fire department that is self-aware of its own strengths and weaknesses is a stronger organization. And that's what accreditation is all about. The other thing I want to touch on and while, while we have you and as a captive audience, and, and I'm keeping you from your dinner and I apologize, Not a problem. <clears throat> but talk to us a little about the National Fire Heritage Center and, and what, what your vision was there and where you think it, it's going and how folks can participate and support the National Fire Her Heritage Center. Well, I'll use a quote from George Santana, who once said that uh, those people who cannot remember history are doomed to repeat it. Uh, the, the American Fire Service has 300 years, in fact, have you ever heard this phrase, 300 years of progress, uh, 300 years of tradition unhampered by progress? And I've never liked it. Well, I hate it. <clears throat> I, I, I think it's completely false. And, and, and my, my uh, reversal of that is we are 300 years of progress unhampered by tradition. I agree completely. And that uh, I, I didn't invent that idea either. It was started up by uh, the United States Fire Administration, who did a scientific study study of, of who is protecting the legacy of the American Fire Service, who is watching out for the, the stuff that's uh, perishable that can disappear uh, one trip to the dump and it's all gone. Right. And we formed that organization about 12 years ago and uh, started the, the process of collecting libraries of people. We are not a three-dimensional museum, meaning that we don't have fire trucks and we don't have uh, a, a big physical display. What we're collecting is the, is the works of people uh, such as Lou Amabilly and uh, Kurt Weldon and people of, of that nature. That's the yeah. libraries. It's a library. Yeah, their thoughts, yeah, the collected wisdom and, and history, really. That's right. You know, which is probably more valuable than the artifacts. I mean, the artifacts are interesting, but the artifacts are in you know, fire trucks and helmets and such. But the, the, the wisdom and the insight and the attitude and the vision is, is, is what created those artifacts. And One of the things I've always talked about is that if, if those fire homes could just talk, we'd be a lot better off. So, because we'd have to find sometimes who did things the first time, who were the experimenters, who were the innovators, who were the, the people who went out of their way to, to improve, make some of those traditional uh, changes uh, that we talk about in the fire service. I, when I lecture on history of the fire service, I often ask the question, how many of you would like to fight fire with a steamer? Right. And, and, right. and yet, at one point in time, everybody fought fires with steamers. Right. Buckets. And, and the interesting part of a steamer is if you go look at the pump plate on it, 1,000 gallons a minute at 150 psi at a 10-foot draft. The performance is there, but the, but the technology has changed. Right, right. And, and that's an interesting point, too, when we get into the weeds, but as we evolve, <clears throat> with what we know now about energy and heat release rates, it's surprising to me that our minimum required flow rates really haven't caught up yet. And, and it'll be interesting to see evolutionary-wise where we are five, ten years from now with water flow capability. So we've got the Heritage Center, we've got the Center for Public Safety Excellence, we've got the Fire Marshal's Office, we've got multiple fire departments in California. Let's talk a little bit about your writing and speaking career. You've spoken everywhere whether it's FRI or fire, uh, Firehouse or FDIC, is there a conference you think that you have not spoken at yet that you want to be at? Uh, that not that I can think of. I, I, I've run a, uh, a lot of airline miles in my time going around. I, I can tell you that there have been some conferences that speaking at has been a, more of a pleasure than others. Oh. And I would say that uh, my experience in working with FDIC was, well, was one of my highlights. Well, thank you. And, and uh, we were honored that you allowed us to give you the Lifetime Achievement Award uh, two years ago, I believe. And, yes. And, uh, we, we, we felt very honored that you were uh, gracious enough to come and share your time with us again. And I think for full disclosure, we should tell folks that the first article you ever published was with Fire Engineering Magazine. Jim Casey. Yeah. 
I, did, I, I wrote an article about fire explorers and uh, I talked to my boss about it and I said, what should I do with this thing? He said, well, send it into Fire Engineering Magazine. And I actually got a phone call from Jim Casey saying, oh, he said, my mother-in-law's name's Coleman, are we related? <laughs> so I don't think so. Uh, but I, start, I wrote for Fire Engineering exclusively for probably 10, 15 years. And then you wrote for our friends at Fire Chief for a long time, you had yes. a regular monthly column, and, and you still write for us with Fire Rescue, a, a monthly column. Right. So over your 57 year career, you're, you're still active and you're still participating and you're still contributing, which I think is amazing. And I think it's so important that the it, it, wisdom doesn't come with education. You know, wisdom comes with the application of experience and education. I would say wisdom comes with scar tissue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, most really wise people have the, have the bruises to prove it. Yeah, 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 it doesn't come easy. And, and so, looking at the fire service today, and, and not to be critical of us, or, you know, what are, you, what are some of your concerns? What are some of your thoughts? What, what do you think we should be focusing, uh, uh, the younger officers, the, the folks who are, who are leading today, where, where, where should they be putting their attention? Where, well, where would a young Ron Coleman be focusing his attention? I wish I was a young Ron Coleman, starting all over again, with, especially with some of the tools and technology we have available to us today. I think uh, this is going to sound like maybe a strange answer, but I think that one of the challenges we have in the fire service is the true identity of what we are to the community. We, we have been almost all things to all people at different times, and we've, we've been successful in some places and unsuccessful in others. And I, I see the, uh, the identification of a true professional fire individual uh, as being uh, still something that we have to seek out and, and strive for, because I don't think we've achieved that, that, that level of identity yet. In other words, there's still di di differences of opinion between big cities and little cities and, and uh, rural fire departments and suburban fire departments. We're all in this together. And matter of fact, uh, if the fire gets big enough, we're all in it. Uh, regardless of where we started from or where we parked our fire truck, we're, we're out there in the middle of, of the fray. And, and I think it's fair for you to say that because you live in California where you try to keep the fire to the zip code of origin. Yes. Which is... And, and in some cases that's virtually impossible. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But, but my answer is uh, that uh, we have this ongoing battle, I think, in terms of developing our true identity as a public save, uh, servant. Is to what do we really stand for? Uh, how much of it can we really do uh, with the amount of resources that we have available to us? And uh, what do we need to do to maximize our, our effectiveness? Uh, those are still challenges that are in front of us. So I'll put you on the spot for a second. Young officers coming up trying to make a difference. What would be a, a couple pieces of advice that you'd give a young battalion chief, captain, lieutenant who's responsible for the lives of men and women under their command, who's, you know, responsible for their community and, and is wondering what to do to make themselves better, for lack of a better word. Gee, how much more time do we have? Yeah. Pick, <laughs> pick the top three. I'll pick, the, I'll, I'll pick a couple. One is, uh, I, I cannot emphasize this strongly enough, and that is that a fire officer of the future has to be able to read the fire code as well as he can read the operations manual. Because what we're moving in is the direction of built-in fire protection, and it's going to get much more complicated than it is today. Hmm. And if we want to preserve our oversight of that, we have to be knowledgeable. So get so, involved with the smart cities technology, smart cities and technology, on with all fire code stuff. development, building code sure. development. Number two is uh, become an expert on community finances, hmm. because the the fire department does cost and there is a benefit. And if we are not able to articulate the value between those two, there's a remote possibility that, that we'll suffer consequences. So I think that the, the, uh, the fire officer of the future needs to become extremely knowledgeable in community finance, not just the budget, that's the spending plan, but I'm talking about 
the, uh, where the money comes from and what resources are being applied to, to specific problems and so forth. Uh, I, I, being candid when I say this, it's not meant as a criticism, but there's an awful lot of people who emerge on the role of being the fire chief who've never even read the budget. They've been in a position in the department where they didn't have to. Now all of a sudden they're responsible for it. And then thirdly, um, and, and you're probably going to know where some of this is coming from, but I really feel that some of our challenge is to de develop a higher level of competency in leadership and management. It's not enough to be what we used to be. we got to be more than what we used to be. Yeah, and I think that the... It's, it, I'm a hopeless optimist and I'm, I'm proud of it and we've spoken many times how I think that the current generation are just some of the most phenomenal people I've ever had the pleasure to be with. Uh, I think it's just always the, uh, maybe we're just jealous that they still have all their hair and teeth. But uh, I'm jealous about the hair. The hair sure. part, yeah, yeah, but the teeth is for me. So the, uh, I think the, the, the upside is that the future's in good hands. Uh, we were. You know, we've been fortunate enough to sit and visit with young men and women who are serving today in the fire service and elsewhere. And, and when you listen to them um, and you hear them, uh, they're, they're pretty impressive folks. Well, if you don't mind me digressing a little bit back into something you asked me about earlier, and that is the history. Sure. Uh, every once in a while I get feedback from people about the fact that the current generation doesn't care about history. <laughs> and if, if that's true, I think we're going to suffer a loss of something. And what, what that is, is the recognition of how far we've come and how fast we've come, uh, 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 along with uh, all the other surrounding technology on our lifestyle. But we still have as much of a need for a fire chief like John Damrell and uh, uh, Croker today as we did 50 to 75 years ago. You know, even if you go back to the, uh, the Civil War draft riots, you know, the fire department was intimately involved. I'm not sure I want to talk too much about what happened in the draft. No, right? no, but, it, but we were there. We you know, were there. We were there. So, you know, you can't, the history is what the history is. That's right. And the revisionists are, you know, making a huge mistake. And, and, and the deniers of history are making a huge mistake. Um, evil exists. It's there for purpose. It's part of life. So, before I let you go, I, I would like to take an opportunity to tell you how important you've been in my career. Um, I can remember reading things of yours uh, throughout my entire career, hearing you speak on multiple occasions, um, being awed by the depth and breadth of your um, expertise, whether it's with the fire code or fire operations or building construction. And beyond that, to me, I think the most impressive thing for me as a, as a firefighter that I was always humbled by, by you and, and, and proud that you were one of us is your um, elegance and, and your carriage and the dignity that you've brought to the fire service, whether it's in uh, how you've resolved conflict, how you've mediated uh, problems, and how you've brought together radically different and divergent people on, on meaningful and, and, and purposeful missions that have benefited the entire fire service, probably the entire world. And, and you've been a fantastic spokesperson. Um, you've really been the model of what a gentleman and, and a firefighter should be. And, and you've, never, you've never once wavered or faltered in your uh, appreciation of the simplest thing we do or the most complex thing we do. And, and that, that is so rare, and you are so rare, um, and how you've been just gracious to, you know, you, you give your time freely and, and you, um, you give your, of yourself constantly and, and oftentimes at, at, at great expense, uh, and, and which is the true um, meaning of duty. And, and you, have, you have answered that call to duty above and beyond. And uh, on behalf of just the regular firefighters out there and, and, and the guys and gals who've benefited from everything you've done, if we haven't said it enough, we're grateful and we appreciate it. And, and we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, thank you. God I bless you, Chief. It. I'm Bobby Halton. You're listening to Trusted Voices. And this is Chief Ronnie Coleman.